The topic is nine fundamentals for a more strategic email program. Why is this an important topic? Um, I talk to a lot of our clients um, and you know companies who are in the same lines of business out in the industry. And one of the trends that I'm seeing is that for a lot of organizations, the people who are responsible for email are not solely responsible for email. Uh, a lot of them are it's 10% of their time or 20% of their time. For many, it's almost 100% of their time, but it's only 50% of their responsibilities. So one of the things that we're seeing is that a lot of people who are running email programs uh, are being pulled in a lot of different directions. It makes it very easy to focus on knocking down pins, getting the stuff done that you need to get done. Um, and one of the things that this this webinar, this topic is designed to do is to give you an opportunity to step back and take a look at the bigger picture of email marketing so you can continue to get done everything you need to get done while still being mindful of your overall email strategy and the health of your email program for the future. So that's really what we're going to focus on in the next uh, 30, 40 minutes or so. And there's a little bonus part to this presentation as well where the last, uh, one of the last fundamentals are seven tactics that you'll actually be able to begin implementing right away to get that near-term lift. So not everything is um, strategic planning for the future. There's going to be some, some information here that's going to improve your email program right away. So first of all, what is a strategic email program? There are a few components that I think are, are that define the strategic email program, and the first of these is balance. Every day there are urgent demands placed on your email program. You have to notify your subscribers about this upcoming board of directors election, or you have to drive registrations to this webinar or that conference, or you have to publish this newsletter and, and increase page views to certain parts of your website. You have to promote a download of that white paper. Whatever it happens to be, your email program is at the heart of a lot of these communications programs. And, and there are some applications that you need that email is uniquely suited to it's fast it's inexpensive it's effective and it requires very few resources so there's really no wonder that it's the go-to communications platform for so many so many applications but if the answer to every communications need is let's send everyone an email then over time the value of that asset that email asset begins to erode and that's a deliberate word choice asset I think it's important to think of your email program as an asset because every time you use it, you're actually using some of it up. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, second tenet is in integration. What I think of is pan-channel coordination. A strategic email program does not operate in a silo. It works in conjunction with all of your other channels. Uh, at Real Magnet, we are putting a ton of energy right now into integrating email and social, and our new application allows us to do that. Uh, if you haven't seen what we're doing, click on over to our blog at some point, to blog.realmagnet.com, and you just get, sort of see the story as it's developing there, and you're, you'll be able to learn what we're learning uh, about how well email and social integrate. Uh, but the thing about, about email is that it doesn't need to operate by itself, and we'll see in a little bit that it can't. So the better it's integrated into your other programs, your other communications channels, uh, the more successful it's going to be. And finally, here's that word again, asset. It's not a tool, uh, and it's not an expense. It's an asset, which is something very, very different, um, which means it's something that, as an asset, you should look to ways to continue to nurture it and grow it so that it remains valuable in the future as well. Here's the image, the central imagery that I think of for the communications asset, and this is central to the whole concept here. <clears throat> Think of it as a jar full of pennies or a savings account, right? There are times when you need to draw on that asset uh, or on that, you know, on that savings account. Some of email's activities, the daily things that you're responsible for, are going to pull pennies out of the jar. If you mail too frequently, if you mail with a lack of targeting, if you don't honor unsubscribe requests quickly and, uh, and easily, all of that chips away at that asset. It pulls pennies out of the jar. So it's really important to figure out how you're going to be putting pennies back into the jar. The other thing that, you know, the other reason I, I like this imagery is imagine this jar is on your desk. <laughs> and every day, one of your coworkers comes in and takes a single penny out of this jar. Every day you're going to sit down at your desk and you're not going to notice a difference. But then at the end of the year, 
all of a sudden there is a noticeable difference in the number of pennies in that jar. And so it's the sort of thing that you don't notice if you're taking a look at it uh, in a very narrow lens, but if you if you step back and you take a broader perspective of it, it really is it's easier to see what's happening and uh, and what you need to do to prevent it from from going any further. So what happens if we get it right? If you have a strategic email program, we've got a few things going for you. Uh, the first is that you have permission to contact your customers with confidence. This is just a fundamental. Uh, you'd need permission to get any place else, but it's not the end game. Um, secondly, you've got an open channel for engagement for business, for engagement in business. And, and, and what that means is that whatever your company is working on, you can start to think from the, the beginning how email can be part of that process. To get a better sense of what that actually means, imagine you don't have an email program. Imagine that channel is closed. Uh, on the one hand, can you even replicate the kind of communication that your email achieves for you? Could you even fill your 500-person conference or your 100-person webinar if you did not have email at your disposal? And if you could, how much more expensive would it be to hire telemarketers to ramp up a social program quickly, to send out direct mail, to fax people, to get on the phone? Uh, it is is such a, a central part of what we're doing. Uh, in so many communications platform that it really changes the nature of business if you think about what would happen if we no longer had it. And finally, you've got the attention of the most important people in the world, and these are your clients and your customers and your prospects, uh, the people who are or who are willing to do business with you. This is very different from permission. If you have kids, particularly between, say, four and teenagers, uh, you know exactly what I mean. You certainly have permission to talk to your kids whenever you want, but you don't necessarily have their attention all of the time that you're doing so. So the end game of email is not permission. The end game is attention. It's people allowing you to talk to them and who are actually anticipating and looking forward to what it is you have to say. And what if we mess it up? Well, this is one of the things that we get. We get empty conference rooms. We get webinars that people aren't, aren't signed up for or dialed in for, into. Product sales languish. Uh, white papers are never downloaded. We're not driving traffic to our website and, and running up page views. And this is what our, our charts look like that we roll out in the weekly marketing meeting. Whatever it is we're tracking, whatever it is we are relying on email to drive forward, whether it's uh, year-over-year membership renewals, or it's website traffic, or advertising page views, or it's conference attendance, or revenue. Uh, if email is responsible for a lot of that, uh, as your email program flags, then all of the businesses that are relying on email are going to show those same results. And finally, nobody hears you. You get crickets chirping. All right? you, you try to tell your members and your customers about a way to save $200 on a conference or there's a new white paper available to download that is targeted exactly at them and is going to make their job a lot easier or you ask them to take some action and in return you get nothing. And so not only have you put a lot of energy into creating product and adding value that nobody is hearing, on the other side of it uh, you've got all of these members who are wondering you know, what's going on with your organization. So that's the prelude, and let's move on straight to what the, uh, what the fundamentals are. The first is to manage expectations, including your own. There are some things that email can't do. The first is reach everybody, and I hear this all the time. We've got to let people know uh, what's happening with our company. I know. Let's send everybody an email. Well, first of all, everybody is not on your list. Uh, there are going to be people at some of your target organizations. There are going to be people who are right in the sweet spot of your product or service offerings who you simply don't know about, who don't know about you. But even if all you mean is everybody who you know about, uh, unless you're consistently enjoying 100% open rates on your email, uh, you're not reaching even the everybody who you do know. Uh, in fact, even if you're getting you know open rates of 30 to 35 percent, which are well above most most industry averages, you're still only reaching a third of the in, of the everybody you know about. Second thing email can't do is grow organically. Think about those pennies in a jar. Who's going to put those back in? Right? Joining your email list 
is not going to go viral like some laughing baby video on YouTube. There's a lot of work that we all need to do to make the prospect of getting regular emails from us appealing to our customers and then enabling them to actually join that list. There are steps that we have to take and it's something that we constantly have to think about because someone is pulling pennies out of that jar every day and that's one of the ways we're going to put them back in. And finally, email cannot serve every business unit completely. It just can't. I mean, part of it is that, like I mentioned before, there are uh, there's only so much that email can do, and it does work better when it's integrated with other or, with other communications channel. But the other way to think about it is that if everybody relied on email for everything they needed to get done and every point of contact with their customers and subscribers, uh, your email program would be crushed under the weight of expectation, and it would it would end it would end up annoying your subscribers from the overmailing to the point that you would have nobody left on your lists. Every presentation should have a warning, uh, a requisite warnings and example slide, and, and this is mine. Uh, the second fundamental is to hold the long view. There's a lot of stuff that we need to do every single day, like I said, that pulls pennies out of the jar, the near-term needs. And I'm not telling you not to do this stuff. You know, send another reminder if you don't get the response that you want. Everything you see over on the left hand of the slide. Sometimes we send messages from or on behalf of our partners. Um, sometimes we'll mail to different business units lists that we'll borrow. Uh, occasionally we'll make unsubscribing challenging. We hide it at the bottom and we use a template that makes the color hard to find or sort of hides the hyperlink or puts it under click here instead of under unsubscribe so it's hard to find exactly the word you're looking for. Uh, and, and, and there are other things that we do as well that I understand and it's part of how business gets done and you know the, the, the message here is not to stop doing everything that you know you need to do to drive your business forward, but it's to take a look at the other side of this of this balancing act as well and make sure that you're finding ways to replenish that asset. Segment and target, for example, finding ways to be more relevant with the messages you're sending um, and then sending fewer messages if you can't be relevant. The better you target your messages, the more you can mail to the people you're targeting, which means that the number of messages who are reaching a prospect who's actually looking forward to that content begins to increase. Uh, revamp your content strategy for greater relevance. One of the trends that I'm seeing is a lot of organizations are moving to niche newsletters. Instead of having a single newsletter for everybody, or in addition to a single newsletter for everybody, I'm starting to see more s narrower newsletters that focus on a smaller segment of this larger subscriber base. That allows them to mail more frequently. It allows them to mail more targeted content. It allows them to make 80 or 90 or 100 percent of the content within that newsletter aimed directly at a specific, uh, a specific group instead of the 10 or 20 percent of the main newsletter that's supposed to be relevant to this group and another 10 percent that's relevant to that group. It really allows a tighter conversation within, within that channel. Uh, internal sender controls is another way that organizations are limiting the opportunity that people within the organization have to send to lists that they don't own. Uh, one of the things that happens occasionally is that if everybody has access to the email list, everybody will use the email list. And even though no one person may be over mailing, the cumulative impact on your subscribers is that they're getting two or three or four times as much email as any given person in the organization realizes. Uh, message limits per subscriber is another way of achieving the same thing. Uh, with controls like this, you can limit the number of messages any individual subscriber receives. So no matter how many lists they're ending up on, they might only get two messages per week or three messages per week or whatever makes sense for your organization. You know, finally, a preferences center where your subscribers can go in and expressly indicate which content streams they're interested in. I want this monthly newsletter. I want that newsletter. Don't tell me about conferences and events because I have no travel budget. Um, and let me know about the industry news that's relevant to me. Everything on this side of the, uh, of the balance here, they all require some time and some effort and some planning and some foresight to execute. But it's like, you know, it's like your savings account. It's like your IRA. It's the kind of thing that we need to put energy into now and resources into in order to generate a payoff later on.
<laughs> the next one is to find a whole story in the metric. So, so let's say we're sending out a newsletter every month, right? And it goes out, and we take a look at uh, the message tracking. And for you know, for a lot of people, if we're busy, if we've got 16 things going on, and getting the mail out is one of them, email analytics very often amounts to looking at the results from the next message and moving on. And it's 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 just the way uh, you know it, it has to be in a lot of cases. So that's what we do, and we say, okay, we got a 25% open rate and a two and a half percent click through rate. Is that good? More importantly. What do we do differently next time, if anything? Because that's the role of metrics. The metrics is not to tell us how we've done. It's to guide action in the future, to make us better next time. So if all we have is that one snapshot in time, we don't really know what the story is. If all we know is that this message, we got a 25% open rate and a 2.5% click-through rate, we naturally can only assume that that's kind of how things have gone, right? We usually get a 25% open rate and we usually get about a 2.5% click-through rate. Without any real context, that's just where our mind goes and that's the assumption that, that we make. Well, let's give this some context. Instead of looking at it just as a snapshot in time from this last message, let's trend our open rate and our click-through rate for our, the same newsletter to the same audience over the last 12 months. And maybe this is the story that our metrics are telling us. We are seeing uh, a meteoric rise in open rate, and our click-through rates are going up steadily as well. We don't know why from this information, but we do know that something is going on. And on the one hand, whatever we're doing, we want to make sure we keep doing it, but it becomes really important to figure out what it is that's responsible for this rise to make sure that as we do start to play with things that that's the one thing that we remain constant. Alternatively, your metrics could tell a very different story. You know, over the past year, you've seen in this example your open rate go from about 42 percent down to 25 percent and your click-through rate from a strong 12 percent down to two and a half percent. So what's going on here? Is there a deliverability problem? Is the content no longer relevant? Have we done something to alienate our subscribers? Have they become less engaged for some reason that we're able to identify? Once you have a, a, a bigger picture of what's happening within your metrics, you know where to look for more information. And so you know what to do better in the future. So take a look at that, that click-through trend. We're going to sort of zoom in on that click-through trend that's dropped from over 10 down to two and a half. So let's say this is a very similar click-through trend, right? Aim for effectiveness, not efficiency, is the, is the focus of this one. So here, what we've seen is over the past year uh, with our newsletter, our click-through rate when we started was going gangbusters, 12%, 14%, and then over the course of the year, the click-through rate has dropped down to 4% or so. Now you look at this, and it looks like really bad news. This is actually a pretty common trend in growing businesses or businesses that are growing um, an email list or a list for a specific uh, newsletter or content stream. Because what happens is as you add more subscribers, the average level of engagement for each subscriber starts to decline. Now, remember that the aim of your email program isn't to have a 10% click-through rate. It's to drive as much activity and engagement out of your email, aggregate engagement, as possible. So in January, things are going great. In February, things are going even better. And then this organization starts to aggressively acquire new subscribers. They go to trade shows and start signing a bunch of people up. They do a sweepstakes on their website where they give away an iPad in exchange for people to sign up for their email list. Uh, they start a Facebook promotion that's similar and they do a bunch of things that are very effective at acquiring new subscribers but the net result is that the, ag the average engagement uh, of these people who are coming in for other reasons uh, begins to drop. But the list is growing so much that the absolute number of clicks that they're getting for each month uh, is still going up. So you take a look at just the blue line, it would be easy to draw the conclusion that this email program is failing, but then when you take a look at the red line, you can draw the opposite conclusion. And if you're in the business, let's say for example, of trying to put 
uh, 500 people in a conference, which would you rather be at? Would you rather have a click-through rate of 12% that's giving you 400 clicks or a click-through rate of 4% that's giving you 1,000 people visiting your website? So take a look at what the overall objectives are, and it's not effectiveness, it's not efficiency as much as it is effectiveness from your email programs. And looking at the metrics in the right way can help you figure out what's happening. The next one is to think in years, not weeks. This is why it's important to take the long view, because little numbers add up to a lot over the course of a, of a year. How many unsubscribes did you have over the past year? Let's say you get one half of a 1% unsubscribe rate every single time you send your, your weekly newsletter. That's not that much. Every single newsletter is inconsequential. But one half of 1% every week for a year is 25% of your list that you've just lost uh, without even realizing it. Because every time it's a handful of people that's inconsequential. So if you look at it in the course of a year, a 25% loss to your email list is a big deal. How many messages did your most popular subscribers receive? There are people on your list who, uh, who show up no matter who's pulling a list and for what reason. They are the most strategically important people to your organization. They are your biggest customers or your most recent customers. They're the members at your organization who are on your committees and who are voting members or who are on your board of directors or who speak at your conferences or whatever it happens to be. We did this analysis for a client of ours and we found that almost 10% of this client's list was getting more than one email per week even though the organization thought that people were getting an average of an email every two weeks or so. And what's interesting is that the most popular recipient, recipients, a subset of that 10%, were getting over three messages per week. So they were getting, they were getting three times as much mail than the people the organization were worried were getting right about the limit of the amount of email they should be receiving. And the next big number is how many messages were never opened. It's easy to focus on your open rate and say, okay, we got 15, we got 20% 20, 20 of the people who opened. We sent 10,000 messages and 2,000 opened. Well, 8,000 didn't open. And over the course of a year, that 8,000 8, becomes, becomes over 100,000, 200,000. If you look at ways to grow the effectiveness of your email program, that's the lowest hanging fruit. It's the people who are already signed up to receive content from you, who are already engaged with your brand in some way, who have given you permission to enter their inbox, but who aren't yet attentive to you. That's the biggest opportunity for most emailers, is to take a look at that open rate and find ways of creating content that's more relevant, of building engagement with that subscriber base, so that you know those 8,000 people who didn't open this last email is only... 7,000 or 6,000 and you can double the effectiveness of your email program in pretty short order by by looking at it in that capacity. The next fundamental is to do better than best practices. I n hate the term best practices. I've found that in this industry it becomes a shortcut for not the best we can do but what's the best we can get away with. What's somebody else doing that, that, we can, that we can copy so that we feel like we've, we've covered our bases? One example of this is that legal does not mean acceptable. Renting opt-in lists is a good example. So if someone is on an opt-in list, and the actual language from the can spam law is that clear and conspicuous notice at the time consent was communicated is what needs to be provided to the subscriber, which essentially means if someone is signing up and into a list that's opt-in, it has to be made clear at the point where they say, yes, sign me up, that this is what they're signing up for. And what they're signing up for, the language is usually, yes, sign me up for information from third parties. Because if you're renting a list, you're one of those third parties. And people do it, and I'm not saying that the people on rent on opt-in lists are actually not opt-in, because a lot of them are, but I think judging from, you know, from my own experience and from I expect a lot of your experience as well, most of us do not willfully opt into lists, yet all of us seem to get an awful lot of email from organizations who claim we have, opt we have opted into their lists. <laughs> but the issue is not whether or not it's legal. It's, it's what we believe. Um... If you get an email from an organization that claims that you've opted in, 
the organization is saying, hey, they said I can mail to them. I'm on the right side of the law. You get that email, you don't know who that brand is, and your response is very simple. I don't know who this is. Opt in or not, I didn't ask for this email. I'm reporting it as spam. Consumers throw that word around very liberally, certainly more liberally than we do uh, as emailers. If they don't know who a message is from, sometimes they feel like the only recourse they have is to report it as spam. So even if you're legal, that is a mark against your deliverability score. That makes it harder for all of your messages to get into that organization, and it ultimately compromises your deliverability score across all of the, uh, all of the ISPs that you're sending to. Essentially what that means is that even if you're legally correct in mailing to people, um, it can still lower your deliverability and make it very hard for you to reach even your best customers who've been on your list for years. The second best practice, second point is that common practice is not always legal. Let's go back to that language again about clear and conspicuous notice at the time consent was communicated. It's very common practice to share lists. Uh, organizations think that as a brand you own this list and you can share it with a partner, you can mail to a part, ma let a partner mail to it one time, or you can even share it with other groups within the organization. Um, there's a gray area here about whether or not that's legal. Uh, it's certainly legal if you, if you have an opt-in list to mail to it on behalf of a partner. Uh, it is not legal for you to give your list to a partner to mail to. And in some cases, it's not always legal for you to let another brand within your organization mail to that same list unless when your, your subscribers uh, signed up, you let them know that they would be receiving mail from you and from other brands within your organization. So the threat here is the same as the other one. It's not so much that you're going to find yourself on the wrong side of the law. Uh, the threat is that you're going to be sending mail that your subscribers are not anticipating and they are, they're, going to, they're going to mark it as spam and that compromises your deliverability. So the next fundamental is to do, other, do unto other channels. The concept I think about is email in the marketing mix. I am a strong advocate of building out your social channels, not because of what they will do for your social channels, but because of what they can do for email. Now, the objection is always, but if we build out our social channels and we move all of our people over to social, we lose the ability to target one-to-one, -one, right? Because that is, that's, that's one of the fundamental differences between email and social. Um, it's true that you don't have that ability to target one-to-one, -one, but the part of that that isn't true is that in most cases, you're not moving your subscribers over to social, you're adding another channel of contact. It's, it's more common that social is an additive channel. So if someone is on following you on Twitter and is your fan on Facebook and they're on your email list, there's an increased opportunity to build relevance uh, within, that, within that customer, within that, that prospect. Because what happens is that the more they see your brand, the more they're communicating, you're communicating with them and they see you in their lives, the more relevant you become. So even if they're not interacting with you a lot on Facebook and Twitter, by virtue of you being there, you are saying, we are open for engagement, we're approachable, and you are creating more brand impressions. That can only boost the effectiveness uh, of your email program or certainly of your communications program in general. So I, I think there's a lot to be learned there still, and that's, that's some of the work that we're doing now with Social Magnet, our new product. But it's, uh, it's, it's a really promising opportunity there, I think, and the threat of cannibalization so far is uh, it's, it's, it's not, really, frankly. Um, another channel that, you know, I've been saying this for about a year, I think, actually a couple of years, I, I think SMS is the next undiscovered uh, marketing channel. SMS was big for a while, you know, the, the concept of sending text messages and doing text promotions. And then, you know, in, in the context of mobile email, the whole concept of SMS, short message, was replaced by simply sending a regular email to a mobile device, which meant really changing nothing but an email template and watching what mobile deliverability looks like. Um, but there's an opportunity, I think, to build an opt-in text-only list, an SMS list. And I've seen some really interesting work done in politics and advocacy, for example, where uh, a marketer needed to mobilize people urgently for to call into a radio show or to go to this location because someone was going to be there or whatever it was. 
And you know, if, if, if you allow for people to opt in on an SMS basis, the number of people who are actually going to do that is going to be very tiny. It's going to be a very tiny fraction of your existing list, but it is an it is the absolute most engaged people within your list. And so even if you're not using that list very frequently, to simply know who within your list is that engaged is pretty powerful information. I think there's there's a lot more interesting work to be done in, in uh, SMS and email. And finally, cross-promote your email brands and content. Your email has a brand. Your newsletter has a brand. Um, your conference messages have a brand. And so think about it from a product manager's perspective. If your job is to grow the relevance of your email newsletter, what can you do to that end? You know, promote it within signature files within your organization. Run house ads promoting your newsletter on uh, in your remnant space on your, on your website. Promote it on Facebook and in Twitter as a brand. And that does a couple of things. Obviously, it's going to drive more subscribers to that to that particular newsletter, that content channel. But it's also, like any branding exercise, is going to make that brand more relevant. So even if your existing subscribers are seeing that ad, it's going to build anticipation for the next time that message hits uh, hits their inbox. And the whole idea is to relieve some of the burden from each message uh, because that's what makes email perform a little bit better. And finally, have other channels do unto you. There's a lot that you can do to optimize email with non-email channels. I mean, one way that we just talked about is to search relentlessly for new subscribers on your website, uh, at your events, any place you have individual contact or personal contact with any of your uh, customers, prospects, or other people who might be doing business with you. Look for all of those touch points and see if there's a way to make it very easy for them to join your email list. I talked about brand relevance, how that drives email anticipation. If you think about marketing your newsletter as as a brand, but your brand itself, the more you're on, you know, the more you're social, the more that's going to that's going to lift the relevance of your brand within your subscribers, um, within your subscribers' minds. And finally, landing pages. Remember that your end game of the email is not just to get people to read and then click through the email. There's something you want them to do on the other side of that, whether it's to get to your website and run up the page views for advertising revenue or to download a white paper or register for event or to participate in a research survey. So the work of that marketing communication doesn't end when the email is done. To make sure that your email is contributing as best as, as well as it can, where your subscribers land after they leave the email becomes really important. Uh, retailers have this down, and they're you know they're they're the best case study. Think of how the retailers move you from the first place you see their you land on their site from an email all the way through the checkout process, and think of ways that you can emulate some of those same tactics within your operation to to get the most out of that email. That won't change your email open and click through metrics but it will change your conversion and it will make your email contribute more powerfully to to the organization. Part of it also is just figuring out where to link within your site to to drive the greatest uh, the greatest result. And you can even without, you know, modifying your website at all, you can modify the email if you know what your landing page looks like, you can create your email so that it is a natural funnel for that landing page in terms of the content and the look and feel. So it all feels like you're bringing your customers right through the same direction. And finally, the last one is to balance strategy with tactics. And these are these seven tactics that you can use this week uh, to begin boosting the effectiveness of your email program. First is hyperlink like you highlight. It would be nice to think that when we send an email to our subscribers, that they open it all the way up to its full height, they turn off their instant messenger, and they turn off Twitter, and they mute their cell phone, and they pour themselves a cup of coffee, and they pour through your whole email un uninterrupted, and they read every single word. Uh, but the reality is that at best they scan, and in many cases. And if they're scanning, if we know that that's what they're doing, then let's make it easy for them to find the important parts. Think of your highlights, your hyperlinks as a highlight. They're going to go, they're going to, their eye is going to naturally alight on the parts of the uh, parts of the page that stand out, and that's always what your hyperlinks are. So instead of if you want, you know, if you want to to drive people to a page on your website to get a hundred dollar discount for conference registration, 
don't put the hyperlink on click here, put the hyperlink on save $100 on registration. That way what they'll see is that message that you want to pull them through the site. And so be mindful of that as you craft your email and then when you test it, take a look at it with a very critical eye before you mail it out and just focus on the hyperlink part and see if it tells the story, the, the abridged version certainly, that you want your subscribers to take away. Second is to post your newsletter online, the web version of your newsletter. This is valuable for a, a number of different reasons. Um, and online, I mean on your blog, on, fit, on Twitter, on Facebook, on any other channel, on LinkedIn, uh, any channel online where you have an audience. One, naturally, this will increase the reach of your newsletter. It'll drive greater readership of it. Two, it's going to promote your newsletter as a channel. So some of the people who exist in these channels who don't know who you are, um, are going to come across it and may end up subscribing. Three, a lot of these channels are more word-of-mouth friendly, so there may be people who are passing it along if there's, if there's powerful content in there, so you can increase your, uh, your reach even further with this. Third is create a mobile template. I mean, I talked a little bit about SMS, but this is, this is email rendering on a, on a mobile device. There was a recent return path uh, report that found that mobile email opens have increased 34 percent over the last six months and some of our clients are reporting uh, that as many as 40 percent of their opens for certain messages are occurring on mobile devices. Uh, mobile devices are obviously your mobile phones but iPads are often included in these metrics as well depending on what research firm or, or metrics are, are tracking them and uh, and other and other tablets you know there's there's a, there's a lot of activity activity in the tablet space right now the point is more and more of your subscribers are receiving their emails mobily so the easier you can make it for them to read and react to those messages the better it's going to be for your program four is be more social a this gets your brand more in front of your subscribers uh, so that it builds anticipation for your messages but B, it also tells your subscribers that you are an approachable company and people are increasingly expecting to do business with companies they believe are approachable. The irony here is that you know email was launched as the great one-to-one -one communications platform and it has become largely single direction and the more we can do with some of our other channels to to change that trend and at least say we as an organization are not just pushing content, we are engaged in a conversation with our, with our customers and clients. Uh, I, I think that can only help everything that we're doing. The fifth is unstick stock messages. You know, the stock messages, the thanks for signing up for this list, thanks for making a purchase, uh, your registration is confirmed, we've just received your application for membership. The stuff that's generated automatically um, from your website or from other places is those are the messages that are reaching people when they are at their most engaged with your organization. They've just gone out of their way, they've taken some initiative, they've sent you some information about themselves, they've identified themselves as someone who's interested in doing business in some capacity with you or have just done it, and the response they get is probably a message that you haven't looked at for six months or a year or longer. Take a look at those messages and make sure they are doing all of the work they can to take advantage of that interest. Are they driving people to your social channels? Are they letting you know what else you have going on for them? They don't need to be targeted, personalized. They don't need to be particularly fancy. They just have to recognize the activity that the customer has just taken, the subscriber has just taken, and take advantage of that attention they have. I think there's a huge opportunity there. Number six is edit more, write less. You're busy. Your subscribers are busy. You know, and for a lot of your subscribers, 140 characters suddenly amounts to a full paragraph. Um, like it or not, I think short form messages are here to stay. Uh, I think you know, Lester Wonderman is the, the founder of direct marketing. And when asked how long a direct response piece should be, he responded, well, as long as you still have your audience's attention. And his point there was, you can write for four pages if you want, as long as you still have their attention. I think the general premise is still true, but that window of attention is a lot narrower. 
than it used to be. So err on the side of brevity with, uh, with your communication and, and start testing that to see if it's, it's going to work for your brand. And finally, send from a person, not from a team. This is something else I think that that has come into email from social media. Our customers increasingly have the expectation that they're going to be doing business with individuals. Um, Twitter and Facebook are at their best when there are actual people behind them and there's an authentic voice. And I think increasingly people are looking for that same thing with an email. It does mean empowering people within your organization to have direct conversations with people. But in many places, it's already happening for Twitter and Facebook. And I think extending that same trend into email makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. And it really opens your brand up uh, so that people will look forward to emails because they realize it's not just automated. It's not just something that's cranked out from a mindless, faceless organization to a big group of subscri subscribers. It starts to feel more personalized and it starts to feel more relevant and that can only help the, uh, the effectiveness of your program. So that's the presentation.